Achtung, Achtung, welcome. You are listening to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, Al Murray, and with James Holland, historian. Now, today is, of course, the 17th of September um, uh, to 2020. And if you're, a re- if you're a regular listener to this podcast, and I'm sure many of you are, you're familiar that um, there is one particular uh, military encounter that comes up again and again in our conversations because I was raised on the, raised on this story as a young man by a by a father in the airborne forces in the 60s and 70s who knew a load of the people who were there and so on so we're we've, we're delighted to um, have some uh, excellent guests to talk to today James who have we got um, well, we've got Major General Adrian Freer, who's a legend of the Parachute Regiment, albeit after 1945, of course. I think, um, Adrian, <laughs> I'm right in saying that you uh, joined the Parachute Regiment in 1972 and um, ended your career in, in, in the Balkans, um, serving out there. Um, and, and we've also got Rich Moore, who's a great old local pal of mine. Um, he used to serve in the regiment and is now doing all sorts of interesting things, but also very heavily involved in the charity that we're here to talk about. So um, we thought we'd just put some kind of sort of in from within the regiment kind of perspective on things. Yeah. So, so Adrian, um, thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's great to have you have you with us. Um, my, my, my father in the, uh, uh, when I was a young lad, wore, wore a red beret and took me to see a bridge too far when I was eight. And so I, that's 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 my first point of contact with it, and the fact that he he had all sorts of robust opinions um, uh, within what he regarded as the airborne tradition about the battle. What is what what was the view when you joined the parachute regiment in the early seventies about what had happened at Arnhem? Because it probably wasn't a as headline a battle as it as it is now. Well, I mean, I think it's always been at the heart of um, not only the regiment but airborne forces uh, tradition. I mean, most people will know that it, that in essence, uh, the ability to hold a bridgehead across the, the, the lower Rhine in September 44 failed uh, as an operation. Um, and we may well come on to talk about that uh, a bit later on. But you, what actually happened um, over those sort of uh, seven odd days with the 1st Airborne Division north of the Rhine has gone down in sort of uh, regimental uh, folklore. Um, um, a lightly armed force uh, facing, uh, you know, heavy German armour and a very competent um, enemy in the Germans. Um, uh, many of the, 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 much of the literature today sometimes underplays uh, the Ger- what the Germans did um, and how effective they were. Uh, and so the sort of fighting spirit and the sheer doggedness and tenacity uh, of the 1st Airborne Division in holding out for as long as they did, as I say, is a, is a centrepiece, really, of uh, regimental folklore and, and remains, remains so to this day, even though clearly it's sort of 75, 76 years ago. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is interesting how, you know, the Parachute Regiment remains one of, I think, if not the youngest regiment in the British Army, isn't it? And, and yet it's, it's as we move forward and... You know, regiments are cut and all the rest of it. There's, there's, the parachute regiment remains absolutely at the heart of the British Army, doesn't it? Um, yes, I would, I'm, I would clearly uh, say so, <laughs> uh, with a slight bias. Um, I think it, it, it well, it does. Um, uh, over the years, it has been central to feeding uh, officers and soldiers into the United Kingdom Special Forces, and it still does that to this day. Um, and I think that has had a, a, a clearly a major impact on uh, on the regiment staying as it does. In um, more recently, with the um, move of of one para into a, a special forces support group role, has clearly enhanced its uh, utility and versatility. Um, and there's no doubt that people join it uh, because you know you've got to go the extra mile to to actually get in and stay in. Um, and that is quite a driver in terms of the selection process through the parachute, the uh, pre-parachute selection company. Um, you know, it requires people with uh, lots of vim and vigour uh, who want to get up and go. Um, and that is very attractive uh, to a lot of young men, which is why, um, we, you know, the regiment uh, recruits well. And do you, do you think that same sort of principles apply to the US Airborne 
regiments as well. Yes, to a to a, to a greater or lesser degree, um, uh, the American. Um, uh, United States Army has clearly the 82nd Airborne Division, the same numerical designation as the as the wartime. Uh, they also have um, a Ranger Regiment with three battalions. Um, and in some respects, I suspect today, um, and it certainly was in my, you know, when I was still serving, that our, we're probably closer aligned to the US 75th Rangers than we are probably to the the 82nd Airborne in terms of capability um, and esprit de corps. Mm. It's a it's a an interesting thing though that the idea of uh, of uh, trying to put this politely from an outsider's point of view of siphoning off the the ambitious and the driven from the from the regular part of the army um, that 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 was clearly one of the issues that 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 during the Second World War was controversial when the Parachute Regiment and Airborne Forces were put together, wasn't it? It was a, it was a sort of fly in the ointment for the rest of the army. Yeah, I mean I think that's probably a fair comment. Um, um, I mean, not only the par- not only sort of the the parachute regiment and airborne forces, but also the um, the army commandos. Um, bear in mind, the commando forces during the war were principally drawn from the army, albeit um, there were Royal Marine yeah. commandos at the time. Um, and th- th- you know, th- those two forces, and plus others, um, you know, the early formation of the Special Air Service uh, Regiment uh, certainly did draw uh, people away from. You know, dare I say it, the mainstream army, and there were there were people who who felt that was wrong uh, and weren't particularly supportive. Yes, because there was there was a there was a there was a history of well, first of all, you got the tension between the the the, the air force and and the air ministry and the army, with the army the army saying, well, we need aircraft to do this, and we, when we have we have the order from from the very highest authority to, for you to supply us with aircraft, and the RAF thinking, oh, we're not particularly we're not particularly interested in doing this. So there was that ongoing tension, not not just at sort of regimental level and it, it, within the army, but within the other institutions uh, uh, I, I, in Britain, wasn't it? Oh, there? very much so. Yes, I mean, I I think when when Churchill made his sort of statement that he wanted a corps of five thousand parachutists, sort of in 1940, um, um, senior air force officers and indeed senior people in the army, um, it it you know it wasn't met with fulsome. Um, and vim and vigour to get it going. Uh, it took quite a lot of time. Um, and yeah. I think, you know, Churchill had to ask a few sort of searching and pointed questions as to ask how things were taking place. Uh, but it was certainly in the early stages run on a shoestring. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and the, one of the other problems is, sorry, um, um, yeah, yeah. Al, but one of, one of the other issues was, of course, is that you've got all these... Um, you know, enthusiastic young men who are keen to kind of test themselves and and you know become among the best possible soldiers they could be, and yet by the time they're first used, first very briefly in North Africa and then then in Sicily, you still haven't sorted out the problem of how to get them to the battle zone in the first place. Not really, because you know if you're if you're top of the pile in terms of being a pilot or a navigator, you end up being in bomber command or you end up in fighter command in the case of being a pilot or, you know, being a fighter pilot. You don't tend to end up as in transport. Um, so you've got this sort of situation. And of course, there are um, all sorts of um, exceptions to this. But as a kind of, sort of general rule of thumb, you've got among the best trained troops in the British Army being taken to battle by the least trained air crew. Yeah, I mean, and, and and it's well known in the Arnhem operation that there was only uh, they would not fly um, pre dawn and after dusk uh, because they didn't believe the air crews um, had the sufficient training to do that um, and the ability to turn the aircraft round to do f- to flight. So, I mean, from that point, uh, James, um, what you say is correct, and it had quite an impact on on this particular operation. Bearing in mind one flight a day, so. Bearing in mind there were three airborne divisions dropped on the Sunday, the 82nd and 101st US Airborne and the 1st British Airborne, in the region of, say, 36,000 men in each, uh, each uh, all three divisions, and probably a little under two-thirds, either by glider or parachute, went in on the first day, for the very reasons that you're, you're saying. Mm-hmm. Um, however, it is worth bearing in mind that... Um, that I mean, throughout, and I don't know about the United States Air Force, but 
uh, Army Air Force as it was at the time. But the Air, the Royal Air Force lost a considerable number of aircraft and air crew. I think some well in excess of 400 air crew um, were lost during the operation, either during the, the fly-in particularly, although the first lift on the Sunday was virtually unopposed. But um, uh, the Germans did capture an operation order uh, very early on and positioned um, anti-aircraft artillery on the flying. And, and certainly by the time the second lift came in on the Monday, the mid-afternoon on the Monday, um, uh, the level of flak against the, the flight flying was considerably greater. And quite a lot of aircraft were lost then and air crew. And then subsequently during the resupply operations uh, for the following round, you know, for the following week. So, so would you say... Uh, uh that this this sort of leading us to sort of where 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 market garden uh, goes wrong is that is that the usp of airborne forces and particularly by this point in the war where the allies have have uh, essentially achieved air, air supremacy and so can deliver men wherever they want in, in within within the physical limits of their uh, of their crews and the distances and all that sort of thing that that if you do do two lifts you squander your surprise which is after all your the, the thing you've got going for you with airborne forces for all their limitations and is, do you think that's that that's what goes wrong with market garden or is it are there th- then things that follow f- follow later in the say on the first day or the second day that then created a, a situation that's unwinnable for first airborne? well forces? um i mean at the strategic level uh, starting at the top and sort of you know trying to work down succinctly um, I mean, there were an awful lot of people who had skin in the game and it was not clear um, exactly, you know, who had, you know, ultimate control. Um, you had, you know, the Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force who'd, uh, under Eisenhower, who had recently moved from London and was situated in Granville on the west coast of the Cherbourg Peninsula. Um, you had Montgomery and 21st Army Group. You had General Dempsey in the 2nd British Army. You had General Breton based back at Moore Park in the 1st Allied Airborne Army. You had Horrocks, part of Dempsey's army, commanding 30 Corps. You had Browning, who flew in with um, the 82nd Orbit um, Airborne onto the Groosbeek Heights, um, commanding the 1st uh, Airborne Corps, uh, before you actually then get down. So, I mean, that's about half a dozen, you know, three-star and above headquarters. And the level of coordination simply bluntly wasn't there. Um, yeah, uh, and, and that contributed at the strategic level. Uh, if you then f- come back down now, down to um, Urquhart and the 1st Airborne Division, um, he was only able to take in two thirds of his force, the 1st Parachute Brigade um, uh, and the 1st Air Landing Brigade, or not all of it, um, on the first lift, uh, dropping sort of late morning, uh, early afternoon on the Sunday. Um, and he wasn't, uh, he had to drop uh, some eight miles uh, uh, to the west of Arnhem. Uh, and um, I mean, that was due to the fact that the Royal Air Force, or the, 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 uh, at the time, had the whip hand in choosing DZs and LZs and, and the flight path. So, whereas today you would plan um, an, an airborne operation, whether that's packed by parachute or, or arguably helicopter. Um, you plan from the ground tactical plan outwards, finishing with the air plan. Uh, in this particular operation, the air plan dominated. Um, and uh, Urquhart's division, or what went in on the first day, uh, had a long way to go to the bridges. And that was the beginning at, at, at the sort of tactical level of where things started to go wrong. So how much... How much uh, um uh, pushback would he have been able to have over the air plan? Because because um, 101st, they they push back and say, well, we're not going to land there. You're going to have to put us put us where we want to go. And it's interesting that that they're able to do that, and maybe that's because the people actually calling the shots are American. So there is this that 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 Brereton and his team, um, 101st, can talk to him in American, if you see what I mean, and and that the that the, the the air plan is something that Urquhart finds he's unable to influence. Um, yes. Well, I mean, partly that was because he, he, he I mean, some people would say it's because um, Urquhart, you know, wasn't an airborne, you know, he... Yes, was new. He, yes, he was he? new. Yeah, I'm, not sure, it, yeah. I'm not sure that's right. I think one of the issues that um, by the time Market Garden went in on the 17th of September, um, I mean, the final decision... 
uh, t- to launch the operation had been made less than a week before. And the orders for mm. the operation were given something like the 13th of September. Now, the plan was actually based on an earlier operation, Operation Comet, which was only which was going to be just the 1st Airborne Division doing what everybody was now doing, i.e. the 82nd yeah. and 101st. And I think because of the complexity of the air plan, um, you know, there was well over, you know, 2,000 transport aircraft, both parachute and, and light bombers pulling gliders. Um, in addition, there was something like another 1,000 you know, fighter ground attack, fighter aircraft protecting the whole thing. Now, the plans for that, you can imagine getting all that, you know, in gear uh, and all sorted out. By the time um, they were giving orders sort of round about the 13th, 14th of September to launch the enhanced <laughs> Operation Market Garden, it was almost too late in the day. And Browning, the Airborne Corps commander, was not minded uh, to change the plans. Um, yeah. I mean, the Air Force had a particular worry about the flak north of Arnhem um, over an airfield called Dalen, Dalen, um, yeah. uh, and that had mm-hmm. quite an impact. So the die was cast, um, and Urquhart had little recourse uh, to get that change. But it, you know, it was to have a profound effect. Uh, uh, if you put yourself in in his shoes, what what? <laughs> Uh, uh, because I mean, it's it's fascinating to someone talking to someone who's commanded effectively at that at, you know at that level. What do you what what do you do when you're in that when you're in a fix like that? Do you do you lump it? Do you say to your brigadiers, well, this is what we've got to do, chaps. Too bad, and and that goes down to the battalion commanders and ours not to reason why, or do you? Do, you know, grit your teeth and hope for the best. Well, I mean, he obviously did the latter. I mean, there's a number of things you can do as a yeah. senior commander. You can turn to your right and resign. Uh, but I mean, <laughs> that, arguably, <laughs> that uh, during wartime, that wasn't an option. So it was a question. And I think, to be fair, um, well, I was not a question of being fair, but I mean, uh, um, I mean, I think Urquhart was a was a bloody good bloke, and there's no doubt. Um, General Hackett, who went on to be very senior after the war, who commanded the Fourth Parachute Brigade, um, commented in in a in a book or something he wrote after the war that Urquhart was the best battlefield commander he had served in throughout the war. So you know, was, although Urquhart hadn't come from an airborne background, there was absolutely no question that um, in, term, in terms of a fighting commander, um, he was he was you know. Uh, an excellent man. I mean, he knew very early on in the early evening of the Sunday after the drop. And one of the reasons he got separated was because he knew that they needed to get, you know, they needed to get to the bridge. And he was, he left his headquarters on, on the DZ just north of Heelsom to go forward and to chivvy people up. I mean, he recognized um, that speed uh, was essential, um, and he, as a commander, went forward. Now, you, you know, a lot of people have criticised that, um, um, but I mean, he recognised that as a commander, his place was at the front, so he could see what was going on. Um, argue, you know, yeah. some people would argue, well, you need to stay back with your headquarters and your communications. Um, and most people will know now that Urquhart went went forward and linked up with Three Power on the central centre route. Um, and for a whole, you know, through, through various circumstances, got cut off, stayed with free power and, and was absent from his headquarters until the Tuesday morning, um, by which time, you know, the, in terms of the battle, the die was cast. Uh, what, 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 well, what, to, 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 to follow on that point, one of the criticisms that you do, you do see is that he, him, ha, him coming forward with, with Lathbury and, and coming to three power's headquarters is that it cramps their style. Is that they think? Oh gosh, we've got the we've got the general with us now, and uh, w- w- you know, rather than rather than it, it sort of has the reverse effect. Rather than it chivying them on and getting them to to move on, they stop for the night because he's he's with them. And and after all, the previous incumbent Hopkinson had been killed going forward, um, and so there maybe there's there's a sense within. You know the, 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 that battalion. They think, oh god, we can't we can't risk the general. Did you think well, that, I think that like, yeah. Any, I mean, any, I, I, I absolutely. And what, to uh, that? Um, uh, what you've just said, Al, is absolutely correct. They did get he and Lathbury, commanding the first parachute brigade, did get stuck with three para, and three para did stop. Um, 
uh, for about eight hours, sort of you know late late on the Sunday, and didn't start moving again till the Monday, um, uh, yeah. early hours of the Monday, you know four or five o'clock, just pre dawn, um, and th- then you can now reflect um, um, on 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 the Germans, and in that time. Um, the the initial blocking lines. I mean, the reason that two para on the southern route got were able to get to the bridge is by the time um, in the early stages, the the German blocking lines had not extended as far south as yeah. the river, um, and two para yeah. were able to we were able to squeeze through. I mean, not without a you know a, a fair amount of fighting um, and some and, and and some various ups and downs. But one and three para, one on the northern route, three para on the centre route, didn't do that. And by the time um, you got to the the, you know, the Monday morning on the eighteenth, the German blocking lines were very firmly in position. Um, and you could argue that that by that by the Monday morning, in many respects, the die was cast uh, because yeah. nothing else got to the bridge really from then on in. Um, so you had something like seven hundred men uh, um, uh, at the bridge, uh, albeit Frost and two para. Frost was a senior man there, um, um, and most of two para was there. But there were also quite a lot of elements of the first parachute brigade there, first parachute yeah. engineer squadron, uh, Royal Army Service. You know, so it wasn't all just two para. It was a sort of arguably a first parachute brigade minus grouping. Um, but yeah. nothing else really moved. Sort of um, certainly west of the the high ground in. Sorry, east of the high ground in in uh, at Arnhem near St Elizabeth's Hospital and and the high ground called the Den Brink. After that, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things that I'm really interested in is 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 you you must have. I mean, can you remember when you first went out there, Adrian? I mean, you must have been to Arnhem so many. Times, I haven't been so many times, and I was I was there last year for the seventy fifth, and I hadn't been been back for about fifteen or you know twenty years, to be honest. Um, uh, so I mean, I. But but as a battlefield, it's all very clearly laid out, isn't it? And I remember Al and I were there last September and we were walking through and suddenly, you, you know, you could just see how various situations unfolded, how the machine guns sort of pointing down from the railway line, down the kind of, you know, the grid system of streets yeah. down towards, you know. And, and you can see why that was, that's canalising people and, you know, and your movement and all that sort of stuff. I mean, you must have also met a fair number of veterans over the years, haven't you? Um, yes, um, and I mean that uh, uh, it was some very very fierce fighting. I mean, um, particularly uh, you know the better part of four battalions: one and three para, eleventh parachute battalion, and the second staff staffs um, from the air landing brigade. They were all, in essence, decimated um, around you know where the uh, the road and the railway narrow round about. Saint Elizabeth Hospital, so about a kilometre uh, from the bridge, um, and they were fed in piecemeal. I think one of the one of the sort of major lessons of 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 the battle um, is that although um, effectively an airborne division uh, landed uh, glider and parachuted north of the Rhine, at no stage was was Urquhart ever able to fight his division as a division. I mean, the whole action became a series of company, principally, um, in some cases, battalion, but more more accurately, I would argue, company um, individual actions. In many cases, unsupported by um, indirect fire, um, uh, either by artillery or their own mortars. Um, and it was fighting, therefore, against um, German armour, and one of the things that the Germans were particularly good at was the use of anti-aircraft artillery, particularly 20 millimeter and 37 millimeter cannon in the ground roll. And James, as you mentioned a minute ago, it was it was those sort of weapons, um, particularly firing from south of the river um, and in the brickworks across the river into those four battalions and then um, machine gun cannon fire from Den Brink that really that effectively wiped out um, uh, one, three, eleven parachute battalions and the second South staffs. But this is reflected in the casualties, isn't it? When you look at you, you look at it, uh, look at who 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 falls at Arnhem and and the officer casualties as well, isn't it? Because because um, uh, you have plenty of left. I mean, plenty is the wrong word, but lots of the lieutenant colonels, are, the battalion commanders, are yes. killed. Or, or, or injured, and and so the it, it's the I mean the, the the infantry teeth of the division, as you say, are being fed in piecemeal, and particularly the chaos of the of the Tuesday, so D plus two, where where they're 
they 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 come up to start lines they get countermanding orders they they the battalions are reduced to kind of company size anyway but by, by this point and still try and um prosecute their attacks i mean how on, how on earth in that situation as a company commander or, or as a as a sergeant major you get people to get up and and have another go after a whole day. The whole Monday is a day of disaster in that same area. How on earth you motivate people to do that? I, it, it, it's one of the eternal questions when you look at the histories of the battle. What got the men to carry on when it looked pretty much like there was no way through? And then the, and then a simultaneous action in the woods as well with, with the 4th Parachute Brigade, which is a similar sort of, uh, they keep hitting this brick wall. It, it, that's one of the things that really, really strikes me is how they... They pick themselves up and they carry on. Um, yeah, and that's that is low level leadership, whether it's young officers, company commanders, young officers, um, uh, senior NCOs, you know, junior NCOs. Um, and it and and it also is, you know, as I said right at the start, it, it and I think this is why uh, Arnhem has such resonance within the regiment and airborne forces. It's that it's that sort of never, you know, do or die approach, really. Um, and uh, the, 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 you know the, the courage and bravery of very young men, very junior commanders. I mean, that's what held it together. Um, and they were, as you as you've just said, Al. They, you know, in both not just the the first parachute brigade, but um, the fourth parachute brigade, sort of north of the railway line, um, up around the Johanna Hove. I mean, and in the woods there, hitting the blocking lines. It was just constant sort of company platoon attacks. Uh, until effectively they could go no more and had and had to withdraw and of course it was it was sort of round about late Monday and certainly into the Tuesday that by that stage um, the die was cast in terms of there was nobody getting through to the bridge um, but then there's you know this so there was the, the second bat the second sort of operation in terms of forming the perimeter um, uh, 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 when again all the sort of qualities we've just been talking about you know came to the fore right we're going to just take a short break ladies and gentlemen uh, we're talking to uh, major general adrian freer um about about the battle of arnhem uh, funnily enough on this podcast we'll see you in a tick hello it's james holland here and on the very odd chance you've missed it I've got a new book out, Sicily 43, about the epic 38-day battle that raged in July and August 1943. It's a story that involves breathtaking action at sea, in the air and on land. Its conquest involved airborne operations, daring raids by special forces, the harnessing of the mafia, attacks across mosquito-infested plains, assaults up almost sheer faces of rock and scrub, and featured an astonishing array of highly colourful characters, and all to a backdrop of relentless heat, dust, mosquitoes, and truly brutal terrain. There's a special edition with extra content at waterstones.com, but you can also get it at Amazon, an array of supermarkets, or any of those wonderful independents that are dotted around the country. Thank you for listening, and grazie mille. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making Talk uh, with Al Murray here and James Holland. And uh, we're talking to Adrian Freer about Arnhem. And uh, before we before we go any further with, with it, um, uh, we'd like to talk about um, the, the Par- Parachute Regiment Charity, I think is the, yes. the other, the other, the other yes. subject at hand. Isn't that right? Absolutely. And, um, and that's why we've got Rich Moore here, my old chum. Um, you know, we, we're all sort of very conscious, I think, that... that that the pestilence has um, fallen hard on charities and organisations and, and charitable organisations and so on, and not least those military ones. And so we were kind of just thinking that with We Have Ways, we can kind of spread the message a little bit. And it seemed appropriate the first one that we kind of show a little bit of attention to, I suppose, is the Parachute Regiment and Airborne um, Airborne Airborne Force Charity. Um, so, Rich, so... Um, Tell us about it. Tell us what the what what the charity does and what are the challenges at the moment. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, yes, we are the Parachute Regiment and Airborne Forces Charity. Um, we were originally formed in, or the origins go back to 1942, um, when Parachute Regiment was first established with with sort of wider airborne forces. And we've we actually at the beginning of this year, first of January 
merged all airborne forces and the parachute regiment into one charity to try and become larger and more efficient and try and help the wider um, airborne forces community, which is extremely important. Um, so really, it does what it says on the tin. We go by the name of support our paras because that's less of a mouthful than the PRAFC. Um, and we support all these soldiers and their families under the objectives. And what we found, particularly this year, and, and obviously because of the issues we've had with COVID, fundraising is extremely hard. And we all know that. Um, but it's become accentuated in, in these times. Yet the demand for charitable funds to the families, to the soldiers, to the bereaved, to the injured is, is as big as ever. Um, that doesn't stop. So we're just one small regimental charity, but we really do need a lot of support. We, we've heard from uh, General Freer there that, you know, the paras punch above their weight. We're sent in at the sharp end and the fallout of that can be so much greater. It can be huge. So on the back of that, we need, you know, we do need a lot of support. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm doing some work at the moment on the on the Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry, as those who listen regularly will know, because I've been banging on about it endlessly. Um, but um, <laughs> one of the things that's, that's uh, I, I discovered last week when I was doing some work up in Nottingham, um, which is where the uh, the um, Yeomanry Squadron barracks still are, um, was the Regimental Welfare Association. It was fascinating because. You know what happened was Myrtle Kellett, who was the um, was the CO's wife when they first went away to war, set this up in I think 1941, and actually her husband was killed in early 1943. But she continued with this work, and you saw the kind of you know the commanders and senior officers were continually writing to her throughout the war, explaining what had happened and stuff, so she could then sort of pass that news on to the kind of wider fraternity, the families and stuff of those who those who were serving. And it continued to play a really powerful and important role once the war was over as well. But is this, I mean, you know, do all these regiments have, have, have organisations like this and like the one that you've got set up? Yeah, most regiments do have something because unfortunately in this day and age in this country, you know, one needs to assist everybody. It's, there's not enough funding to go around with all the important services, whether it's NHS or police or fire or whatever, all, all services and everything needs a little bit of assistance. It's, it seems a little unfortunate, um, but often military regiments are, are slightly overlooked unless there is a major conflict going on, and then it's every, in, in everybody's sort of front page and in everybody's minds. So without something like that, um, yes, most charity, most regiments have had to establish a form of charity. I mean, I suppose. Uh, sorry, I suppose the other thing you're also not up against um, is that. All the other regiments have long since merged to be reorganised and essentially sort of vanished into the into the regimental soup. That now that that, that you know that the red the red beret, the parachute regiment, has 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 carried on as a sort of straight line through the since its origin, really, hasn't it? In a way that, say, the green jackets, who were the ox and bucks, who are now, I think, rifles, and who could. Who could be something again after the next reorganisation? You know, you're fortunate. You're fortunate enough in having that, I suppose. I think that's exactly right. We've we've sort of been there. We've we've stood the test of time since since establishment. And again, it goes down to the kind of job and the kind of role the blokes do on the ground. Um, it's proven very very effective. And so we have stood the test of time in that respect. And and really, you know, when it comes to fundraising, traditionally, it's our own doing it for their own we've had to fundraise internally i mean in a way Al, that probably resonates because of your father and you know here we yeah. are saying what can we do to help each other um yeah it, it, it's an important part of of being in the family so to speak yeah yeah absolutely so what are the sort of things that we're going you know what are the sort of things we can do i mean obviously we can tell everyone about it and anyone who wants to donate can donate and we'll 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 you know we'll flag up a um, a, a website or links or all that kind of stuff. But but what other things can, can one do? Yeah, I think, I think um, just to say, the use of proceeds, what we use money for, I just want to add that because it is important. Yeah. They're, they're, they're all, everyone sort of has an imagination of what people or, or what these sort of uh, military regiments spend money on. For us, we're doing a lot of mental health, which is a massive issue. Um, it, it includes suicides, it includes various forms of PTSD. It's, it's quite extreme and we, we try to step in um, you know, to prevent anything like that and to catch 
catch matters early. That takes time and resource. We're dealing with existing veterans, including from, from World War II, including from Arnhem. Um, we're looking after them and their families where necessary. And, you know, even up to the recent conflicts, we're dealing with three triple amputee soldiers from, from Afghanistan, for example. So it, it wow. runs through everything, the bereaved, the widows, the children, the families, all this sort of stuff. So to help, if we can raise money in, in any way. So pushing the message out and pushing the awareness of the charity out is really important. And simple things, if we can organize, uh, you know, walks or, or events or things like that would be very helpful, difficult at these moments in time. Um, I think, Al and, and Jim, it'd be great if you uh, fancy doing a sort of 60 mile tab to raise a little bit of money. That'd be quite fun. Um, but maybe the, maybe, Get me in. Yeah, okay. maybe the easier <laughs> thing to do, maybe the easier thing to do is we can, at the moment, you know, if you're in a pub, which you can't get to very easily, but if you're in a pub and you see an able soldier there, you, you, you might well buy him a pint or something like that. You might well do that. We've got a, you can text Paras5, P-A-R-A-S-5. That gives five pounds to the charity and that's used in the right way. So if you're going to buy a, a mate a pint or even yourself a pint or whatever, if you could text Paras5, that's five quid to the charity. That's massively helpful. That's what everyone could do right now if that's, uh, if that's something you could push. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm, I'm, as soon as we're off, I'll be texting. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so, Adrian, um, uh, to, 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 well, not to come back to Market Garden, but to, but to ask a, a sort of a sort of cultural question away. Is, is it sometimes? And this used to this used to sort of having grown up again, having grown up all of these stories. The thing that used to sort of irk me a little is that Normandy doesn't get half the sort of kudos that um, that the Arnhem battle gets, and 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 Normandy's Normandy's the one that goes well. And I always sort of think what is it about what is it about our sort of uh uh view of the second world war that the 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 the, 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 the defeat is the one that uh it excites the imagination in a way perhaps that the, the the victory doesn't yeah that's a good question um and i mean i think if i reflect back uh when i first joined in the early 70s um i was bluntly completely unaware of um, the 6th Airborne Division's role in Normandy. Um, and I remember very early on meeting the then <laughs> regimental secretary, um, a chap called Claude Millman, who had been in 13 para. Um, and he was at great pains to tell me that he was not in, he was in the 6th Airborne Division. Um, and at the, at the outset, that didn't really resonate with me. I wonder, what's he on about? Um, and it's quite interesting that that people uh, reflected almost um, their division uh, before their their regiment, i.e. 13 para, and before their regiment. Um, and, I mean, the inference was very clear. I was in the 6th Airborne Division, and therefore I was at Normandy, um, and that was successful. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I don't... I don't for one moment suggest that that was uh, that in any way implies a criticism, um, but it just it just shows you uh, what the sort of thought process was um, in those de- yeah. in those days, and um, and I mean and I think therefore you know uh, more answering more directly what you've just asked, um, it, it's sort of almost part of the sort of British sort of DNA British character, isn't it? That when you know people reflect more on you know. And what has happened in extreme adversity, um, of which yeah. Arnold was. Now that in any that in any by any stretch of their imagination uh, should not underplay um, uh, what the Sixth Airborne Division did at Normandy. Equally, it shouldn't underplay um, what the other two, what the two American Airborne Divisions did on the Cotton Tan Cherbourg Peninsula. But because both the Eighty Second yeah. and the Hundred and First dropped at Normandy. Um, stayed in the line for what you know five or six weeks um, each respectively before being withdrawn and reconstituted and going into Arnhem into Market Garden. Um, yeah. So, um, but there is that, that that you know it's just that sort of thing that that Arnhem Arnhem just is is there. It's that sort of it's almost that je ne sais quoi. You know, it's very hard <laughs> to explain uh, what it is, but it just resonates. Rich, I um, just on that sort of Normandy and, and then turn around to Arnhem. 
a few years ago I was in Arnhem and we were having a regimental and charity dinner and I was sitting next to uh, Laurie Whedon who was one of the glider pilots in Arnhem and I was, I was chatting sitting next to him probably shouldn't have been sitting next to him but I was I happened to be so and uh, he'd won a significant award for uh, for action and for his flying and uh, I was asking about it and he said, I, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have earned this. I didn't want to, I shouldn't have earned this. And I said, why, you know, why, why, why are you saying that? And, you know, it's very impressive what you've done. And he said he was coming into Normandy on his glider and full troop in the back. And he said, as they came down, there were two machine gun posts, one on the sort of on the, on the headland. And there was a dry stone wall and another machine gun post, both of them opening up on them. He said the, yeah. the rounds were coming in. They were strafing the, 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 the aircraft. He said it was horrific. And he said they came in. He landed on the first machine gun post and squashed everyone, bounced through the stone wall and hit the other one and squashed all of them. Doors went open. All the guys ran out said, that was incredible flying. You saved us. Thanks so much. Brilliant. And they all went off to do their job. And he said, I didn't. I said that's, that's incredible. You definitely deserve that. He said, I didn't. 200 meters out, he said the rounds in the, it was so intense, he closed his eyes and took his hands off the wheel and was just waiting for that one to hit him. So by pure oh. luck, <laughs> he Isn't hit those two. Amazing. Good God. Anyway, right after that, he got turned around and trained up for Arnhem. So yeah. quick, quick turnaround and no time to think about it. Yeah, yeah. I remember talking to Ted, e Ted Eaglin, who was in 8 Para, who did um, Normandy and the, um, and the, and the Vasal landing. He did Vasty as well. And I, I remember asking him, I said, you know, you're in 6th Airborne Division. What did you make of the, what happened at Arnhem? And he said, oh, you know, bloody first Airborne, screwing it up. Yeah, typical. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, you know, was, a, was, a, was certainly a, a, another way of looking at it, <laughs> a, a fresh perspective. <laughs> well, I remember talking at like great length to John Waddy, who I'm sure uh, um, Adrian and Rich, you, you may have come across and you'll certainly know who he is. And... Um, I must dig out that interview because that would be great. Work. We recorded it very, very good quality, actually. So that's one we could actually put out as a podcast at some point. But he was just fascinating. I mean, really, really interesting about. And him. he's still going. He's now. I think he's now. Well, he is a hundred. Um, yeah, 100, yeah, was a company commander in one five six power in the fourth parachute brigade and was, was you know, was badly wounded, um, and yeah. then remained in the army in the airborne forces after the war. But um, you know, quite a character. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, well, well listen, I mean, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for talking to us today, Adrian. Um, it, uh, it, th there's, there's something about um, speaking to someone, you know, uh, sort in it, that, that, you, that you've commanded at that level and that the idea that you would, that you would, do you have the option of resigning <laughs> in this situation? It's quite incredible. Because there is the folklore, isn't there, that he went to the, Urquhart went to Gail and Gail said, you need to, you need to say no to this. You need a coup de main party on the on the bridge, and you need to, you need to. Uh, I, I'd resign if I were you. Is 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 the story, isn't it? I don't know. We don't know how true that is. It certainly doesn't doesn't come up contemporaneously, but it sort of it's a fragment from the seventies, right. as far as I understand. Yeah, but there's there's apocryphal stories that um, that 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 Gail uh, wouldn't have done it that way, um, and somebody yeah. who had as we've just been talking about, had commanded uh, the 6th Airborne Division uh, very successfully holding the eastern um, eastern flank of the Allied landings and, and on D-Day. Um, he knew a thing or two. And, of course, he was instrumental um, in, in, in the coup de main on the, um, what became known as Pegasus Bridge. Um, yeah. Um, and I think Gale would have probably almost certainly wanted to have dropped a brigade um, just to the south of the bridge on the polder. Of course, the polder at Arnhem, mm. a, a lot of people said, was unsuitable to drop parachutists on, which was absolute nonsense. Um, yep. But there we are. But there we are. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. It's been really, really fascinating to talk to you. And, and Rich, thanks for coming on and talking talk to us about the charity. Uh, was it Para 5? Was that what we, we text? Para's 5. P-A-R-A-S 5. Para 5, the money goes to someone else. Yeah, it does. Para's Paris five. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. Cheerio. Pleasure. Cheerio.